All right, welcome to the first session of the Niagara Region Seat at the Table program, Inspiration, Insight, and Information. We are excited that you're able to join us today. To start, we are recording tonight's session, or parts of it at least, so that those who aren't able to make it can still hear us. Unfortunately, with the webinar set up, you're not able to turn on your videos or adjust your microphone. So if there is any questions you'd like to ask, I've seen a number of people have already started to put things in the Q&A section or in the uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen. So my name is Cassie Ogany. I'm a settler with European ancestry and currently I'm the manager of diversity, equity, inclusion and indigenous relations at Niagara Region. I'm assisted by Diana Houston, regional counselor and chair of the Niagara Region Women's Advisory Committee who will be moderating the panel discussion. As we take a moment today to reflect on the importance of the land on which we gather, our provider and sustainer, we look to understand the history of the land. Niagara region is situated on treaty land. These lands are steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The Turo Wampum is the first known agreement between the First Nations and Europeans. It's an important symbol of everlasting equality, peace, and friendship and remains the foundation upon which Canada was built. We recognize that this mutually respectful relationship between nations is essential for reconciliation today. Many people say that the foundations of democracy are built on the gatherings of the Haudenosaunee and their practices of collaboration between nations. We hope that by encouraging more diverse voices to be heard and rise up in positions of leadership in Niagara, it can be more reflective of those collaborations many years ago. There are many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The Regional Municipality of Niagara stands with all Indigenous peoples, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. I encourage you all to do more to learn about the history and current situation of Indigenous peoples. This will help us better understand our roles and take responsibility towards reconciliation as treaty people, residents, and caretakers. So to start with tonight, I'm going to launch a poll uh, I'm going to launch a couple of polls, but the first one is for us to find out a little bit about who is currently around the table this evening. It's a set of seven demographic questions. For each, you can choose prefer not to answer. Uh, I will note that due to Zoom capabilities, the prefer to self-describe option uh, doesn't allow you to actually self-describe. So you just choose that one, but you can't write anything in. Also, there was limited options. Uh, so the last two are a bit of a combo deal. Um, and I will provide some information about the session while you complete that poll. This session is part of a project called Canadian Women in Local Leadership, funded through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Women in Gender Equality. We have partnered with the Greater Ch Niagara Chamber of Commerce, Women in Niagara, City of St. Catharines, YWCA, Future Black Female, Services for Humanity, Muslim Senior Circle, and Niagara Region's Women Advisory Committee to organize tonight in future sessions. Thank you uh, as you are continuing to do the poll. Uh, we're about halfway through at the moment. Um, and so we've also enabled live transcript. I apologize, I just turned it on now. So you can see the closed captioning on your screen. It's not perfect, uh, but it's pretty close. If you can't see it, there's a, one of the icons at the bottom of your screen says live transcript. You just have to click that and make sure that you change your view so that you can see it. All right, I'm seeing that uh, we have primarily women here, uh, a couple of men that have joined us, thank you. Um, mostly English, but a couple of Francophones, welcome. And uh, quite a range of um, ethnicities as well, though predominantly white. And a um, few members of the 2S LGBTQ plus community. Uh, someone is saying their submit button is not working. That is very odd. I'm not sure why that would be. Um, and a good range of ages as well. And good representation across the different municipalities. So excellent there. Uh, there's a few people that haven't yet participated. Oh, one of our other panelists uh, attendees is saying that you have to make sure you answer all the questions before you can submit. So just make sure you've answered them all. There's just a couple other people that haven't yet.
So I am going to tell you a little bit more and then we'll see how that goes. So after the keynote speech by Velma Morgan, there will be some time for questions for you to pose to her. Feel free to post any questions uh, in the Q&A or at the chat. Uh, if you are using uh, the live transcript, you might have to toggle between it and the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I will remind you to keep the chat and questions considerate and respectful. Uh, after the keynote speaker, then uh, Diana will introduce our three panelists and moderate a discussion with them, taking questions from you at the end of some predetermined questions that we have. And then I will close the session with some information about upcoming sessions. All right, I'm gonna close this poll now. And then I will share the results with you so you can see them too. I'll just give you a minute to scroll through those. All right, and I'm going to launch a second poll while I introduce Velma. So this poll only has four questions and it's a baseline to find out what level of knowledge you might have of understanding and confidence regarding the topic tonight. So I'm gonna to introduce to you our honorable keynote speaker, Velma Morgan. Velma has experience in creating and implementing public policies and programs in the Ontario provincial government. For over 10 years, she advised cabinet ministers in five different ministries. Her comprehensive knowledge of government and public policy processes allows her to quickly decipher and analyze complex issues and positively contributes to a solution. As an advocate for gender and cultural representation and inclusion in government, she ensured that the voices of marginalized communities were reflected in the government's policies and communications. She also helped to strengthen collaborative ties between racialized communities, youth and government in new and innovative ways. Community and business leaders of a variety of backgrounds regularly solicit Velma to deliver results in the area of policy, community, and social development. As chair of Operation Black Vote Canada, she's the architect of the first ever Black Community Provincial Leaders Debate, Black Women's Political Summit, and Next Generation Political Summit. She also co-created the 1834 Fellowship. A sought after pol political and public policy commentator, Velma is featured on television, radio, and print. She has been featured on CBC's Metro Morning and The House, and in various Canadian, Caribbean, and British newspapers. Velma is the recipient of the John Brooks Community Foundation Scholarship Fund, Community Service Award, the TNT Eagles Community Service Award, the Ontario Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration Volunteer Award for her service and commitment to youth and her community, the Canadian International Black Women's Enterprise 100 Black Women to Watch 2015, 100 ABC uh, 2018, and the 2021 City of Toronto Bob Marley Award, and the 2021 BBPA Harry Jerome Awards. So a huge welcome to Velma, and we look forward to hearing your address this morning. So I'm going to just um, close this current poll that we've got, and looks like we've got lots of interest in different areas and a range of confidence, knowledge, and understanding. So we are excited that everyone is here. The panel portion of the program today. Um, so I have the honor of introducing um, our panelists and I'm gonna begin with April Jeffs. April Jeffs was appointed chair of the Niagara Parks Commission effective January 31st, 2022. She was first appointed as vice chair of the commission in January 2019, and April becomes chair of the 12 person provincially appointed commission. She completed a certificate in tourism at Niagara College and worked in the tourism and hospitality industry for several years um, before raising her family. She's an entrepreneur and founded a wedding and photography business operating the company for the past 20 years. In addition to her business background, April has a long commitment to public service, including being elected as the mayor of the township of Wayne Fleet and serving as a Niagara Regional Councillor from 2010 to 2018. 
April was also co-chair of the Public Health and Social Services Committee and vice chair of the Budget Committee during her term on Regional Council. She also ran in both the 2018 provincial election and the 2019 federal election as a candidate for Niagara Centre. She currently serves on several boards, including Goodwill Niagara, Arid Recovery Homes, and the Port Colburn Wayne Fleet Chamber of Commerce. So at this time, I'd like to welcome April Jeffs. Our next panelist is Liz Hay. Liz is a second generation settler in Niagara. She identifies as a disabled woman and currently serves on two Niagara region committees. The Accessibility Advisory Committee, where she provides advice and feedback on the Ontarians with Disability Act and the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability Acts, and also on the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Diverse, uh, Advisory Committee, which aims to provide advice and recommendations to regional council and staff on creating a more inclusive and welcome, welcoming community. Liz currently works at Brock University as an undergraduate student advisor in the Faculty of Humanities, where she has helped, uh, she's worked for a number of years helping student, students navigate what can be a complex and challenging pathway to attaining their degree credential. Welcome, Liz. And our third panelist is Rowena Santos. Rowena currently serves as a counselor with the City of Brampton, where she became the first Filipino elected to council in 2018. Prior to being elected, she worked at the Ontario Legislature for over a decade, most recently as director and has mentored countless youth to be politically active across the GTA. Before politics, Rowena worked in a number of top tier corporations, including Magna, RBC and General Mills. She was also the program manager of corporate citizenship with Imagine Canada and executive director of the Imagine, working with venture capitalists and entrepreneurs at the Center for Social Innovation. She currently serves as the chair or vice chair on, a, on several of council's committees and is a board member with the Federation of Can Canadian Municipalities where she serves as vice chair for the Anti-Racism and Equity Committee and also on the Increasing Women's Participation in Municipal Government Committee along with a few other committees that <laughs> due to time, we're not gonna list them all. Um, she's also a mom and plays the guitar in a local band called Point of Order. Welcome Rowena. So um, the Seat at the Table program is a Niagara Region initiative that aims to bring attention to the low representation of women and especially underrepresented women or uh, women of color in municipal governance. The most basic function of a municipality is to serve its citizens. However, the quality of that service is at stake if the policies and programming do not reflect the citizens that it serves. Each of you have contributed to local governance, either as an elected official or by participating in a municipal committee or both. Today, we're here to learn about your experiences and hopefully inspire a few others to get involved. So starting with April, um, I'd like to ask you, what inspired you to get involved in your community? Were you active in advocacy before you were municipally involved? And was there a specific issue or cause that you were passionate about? Uh, what kind of work did that involve and why did you feel your voice was needed? Well, thanks, Diana. And first of all, I want to thank you for hosting uh, this event and for the, the women's committee that you serve on, that you chair. Um, I think this is fantastic. When I was on council, regional council, we, we I don't believe we had anything like this. So, you know, good for you to, uh, to bring this forward and, and you have lots of attendees tonight. So it shows that it's, it's really needed. Uh, but to answer your question, for me, there, well, I ran, uh, so the first time I ever delved into politics was uh, the 2010 municipal election, and I ran as mayor, and there were a couple divisive issues, and, and that's what got me interested, one of them being a proposed sewer and water project that was going to have, you know, several impacts in the community, and what really became an issue was the divisiveness in the community. So that I felt at that time that I could really bring the community together and work to kind of restore the relationships 
um, with uh, stakeholders within the community, outside of the community. We had some issues with um, one of our local uh, local groups to, and the fire department. You know, some we're talked about uh, rural perspective and some of the things that uh, that happen in rural communities. And so um, I felt, and I felt being a woman and kind of approaching things a little bit differently that that I could be successful. And I think to a certain, I like to think to a certain extent that I was. Um, in terms of advocacy prior to uh, prior to running, I did serve on a couple of boards, one of which was St. John Ambulance. And from that, I began to do, um, I, I joined Therapy Tales Niagara. And so, so where I'm going with this is that we would visit, we had our, our dogs with us and we would go and visit retirement homes, um, uh, you know, areas, organizations with children with special needs. And that's where I began to really, it really opened my eyes. I was younger. I was in my mid thirties. I was raising my kids and I'll be honest, I hadn't really been kind of, I was very self-focused. So it got me out there um, and seeing, you know, the needs in the community. And then that all tied in with with wanting to run at the at the municipal uh, at the municipal level, so um, so yeah, I think that's that's where I landed with that. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think there are a lot of people in their thirties getting involved in in committees and boards, but you know, it's also important uh, that women are also represented on boards uh, for not just for you know effective business operations, but to for those leadership opportunities, right? Um, Rowena, did you um, did you want to speak to your advocacy efforts and what you are passionate about? Yeah, for sure. And and good evening, uh, Niagara. It's really a, an honor and pleasure to participate in such an important event uh, virtually from the city of Branton. It's amazing how we're able to do this all together. And thank you, Diana, and everyone for inviting me to be part of it. Diana and I serve on the board of FCM together. And when we met for the first time, um, I was very excited to get to know Diana more and her advocacy efforts, especially for women in leadership positions. That being said, um, I started getting involved and interested in politics, particularly at the municipal level, when I was 28 years old. And that was a long time ago, believe it or not. And so when, when I was 28 years old, I was not living in Brampton because I was too cool to live in Brampton in my 20s. And I was instead living in Parkdale High Park in Toronto because um, that's what you do kind of when you're in your 20s. You move away from home and you, you know, live in another city sometimes. And um, that's kind of how I met Velma through Equal Voice as well. So Velma and I, um, now that she reminded me, we, we go way back um, to those days. And when I was 28, I was working in the private sector, um, specifically at, at General Mills. And I um, felt like I needed to do more, like I needed to make a difference. And in Parkdale High Park, you know, when you're in your 20s, you're very idealistic. And at the time, I cared very much about the environment. And the local councillor at the time, how dare they, wanted to destroy century-old willow trees that were at the waterfront of the lakeshore in Toronto near Parkdale. And that got me really angry. So I got, I got involved with residents' associations. And then I found out that the election was happening. And at the age of 28, I put my name in the hat, <laughs> not knowing what I was getting myself in for, and um, put together a like a huge group of young people, diverse people, talented people who had no experience in politics whatsoever. And we put together a campaign to run on a platform to save those trees, but also on a platform to change the face of Toronto City Council at the time, which was predominantly white men. Mm -hmm. And when I ran, there were 14 candidates in the race. Again, predominantly white men who were running in the race and this little 28 year old Filipino in Toronto running in the, in the ward. And at the end of the campaign, I came in second place and lost by 700 votes. Wow. And 14 candidates. And so, you know, that inspired me to think, you know what, if, if, if we could do that, and we had such energy in the campaign, completely different from anywhere else. And at that point, somebody hired me as their executive assistant to work at Queens Park. And from that point forward, I've always been involved in politics on a mission to elect more women and more people of color. 
And so for 13 years after that at Queens Park, I managed campaigns successfully, but only uh, agreed to manage campaigns for women and for people of color. If somebody told me to manage a campaign for some white man, I would say no. And, <laughs> and, and, and through, through that commitment and organization, um, by 2018, the Ontario NDP uh, hit historical numbers for the number of women that were elected and the number of people of color who were elected. And at that point in 2018, I was living in Brampton as a single mother. And um, I said to myself, you know what, I've been helping to elect so many other people, maybe I should run myself and see if I could win myself because Brampton needed a lot of help in terms of representation. So I ran, I ran a campaign to win to Velma's Point and won and it has been a fantastic four years ever since making a lot of changes here in Brampton. That's phenomenal. Thank you for that. And I, I just want to point to something important. You said that even though you didn't win your initial campaign, it actually opened some doors for you and created opportunities that perhaps you weren't expecting. So um, I think that's an important message uh, for our, our audience here today. And Liz, of course, I can't forget about Liz. Uh, Liz, you are not, I don't think you've, you've been elected to politics. You're, you're, you've been more of an advocate and have participated in, in uh, governance committees. Can you speak to, you know, what inspired you to get involved in, and where, what your passion is? I just want to start by echoing everybody's thanks to Velma for her really insightful words. They've given me so much to think about and so many ways to to reconsider the way I the way I act in public spaces, and I'm just incredibly grateful for that insight. So, like Rowena and like April, I actually started fairly early in terms of advocacy, in terms of advocacy, although not in the political arena. So, in Niagara, in the mid '80s. Kristen French was murdered. Mm -hmm. And that was actually the impetus for me getting involved in civic issues, and particularly in violence against women issues. As a survivor of sexual assault, I thought it was really something that I wanted to make sure that voices were heard so that people could understand that people who survived sexual violence had important things to say and people that were victims of sexual violence needed to be remembered. So that was sort of how I got how I got started, what gave me my voice. And from then I also contributed actually to the first mission statement for the first hospice in Niagara. That was a really exciting time because we didn't have at that point a hospice in Niagara at all. So to be able to start to think about issues of living well while dying in a time when that conversation really wasn't happening was super exciting for me. So that was another piece that I, that I began to work with. As far as, I, I think probably I had a bit of a gap in terms of a public voice for a while because I was busy <laughs> being a human being and getting involved with making sure that my own daughter had a good start and felt that she had her own voice to launch as well. I'm trying to think really when I got started in terms of using my voice for disability. And probably that started when I was working at Brock and noticing that disabled students often didn't feel like they had a voice. They didn't feel that, that there was something that they could do coming from the 1980s when the medical model would tell you that disabled people had to have other people have agency for them, it was important for me to start to talk to disabled students and say, you can have your own agency. You can stand up or advocate for yourself and really make sure that your own needs are being met because you know best what you need. And so I think that was where my where I got really reinvigorated in making sure, again, that people who traditionally were 
stepped over and ignored, mm. were brought, and it's, it's funny because for me, it's not bringing them to the table. It's like, it's saying, wait a minute, this table is the wrong height. This table doesn't work. We don't need it. We don't need to bring people to the table. We need to make a new way of bringing people together because the table just, <laughs> it doesn't fit. Yeah, we need a new table. We need a new, we need a new, a new mechanism. I think, yeah, there's just fundamental change need, needs to happen rather than just saying, well, we're going to bring you into a broken system and let you be part of our broken system. Mm -hmm. Um, so Liz, I, I want to follow up with a question for you. Um, not everyone wants to run for politics, or maybe they're not ready at this time to run for politics. Maybe it's a later in life um, decision. However, yeah, you participate on a number of our governance committee, and I thought it would be helpful for those who are considering perhaps um, committee work or, or participating in boards to speak about um, the work that's involved in those committees and, and what support you need in order to be able to fully participate? That's a really important question because not everybody, as you said, wants to be involved in municipal politics. It can be really daunting to put your name forward and have people choose or not choose you. And also some people don't have the time or the resources. So I'm not, but in terms of speaking to advocacy, I think that the roles of people on those governments, governance committees really lets it lets people have a step back and to think, well, wait a minute. So for example, on the accessibility committee at the region, anything that might impact disabled people. So that's anything from poverty initiatives to housing, to transport, to sidewalks, to the Canada 2022 games, everything, everybody makes a presentation to that committee and says, how, how does this impact people that are disabled? What are the things that we're missing? And it makes sure that a range of people with a range of different experiences of disability have an, an opportunity to really participate in a very vital way in governance issues without necessarily being elected. That's great. Thank, thank you, Liz. Um, so I'm going to turn this one over to April and then Rowena. Uh, putting your name on the ballot can evoke strong emotions. It can be scary. It can be intimidating. It can be exhilarating. What motivated you to run for office and how did that make you feel and what support did you need in, in order to run your first campaign? Was there anything about the experience that surprised you? I'll start with April. Okay, thanks, Diana. There's a lot of questions there. Yeah. So again, going back to bringing the community together, I mean, that's what definitely inspired me to run. And that first campaign uh, in 2010 was interesting because the incumbent mayor was female. And then, um, of course, so am I. And so then, and it was just the two of us in the election. And, um, and so I was successful, which was, which was great. Um, and then I'll just jump ahead in the second election um, in um, 20, 2014, there were actually three of us that female, like strictly three female mayor candidates in a little rural municipality of Wayne Fleet. Um, and I thought that was so cool. And it was a really, it was a really good run. Um, but just going back, yeah, so like, as I said, there were several issues in the community. Um, I wanted to help. I've always wanted to help. And in terms of um, support, I think it's, it's I, I definitely had, um, actually, I had a team of all women who were helping me. And in Wayne Fleet, when you go canvassing door to door, you can't really, only along the Lakeshore area, can you do it by foot. Um, you really need to drive. So I had a couple close girlfriends that would drive me day in and day out uh, throughout the township to knock on doors. And, and we, we hit almost, uh, almost every door um, in the municipality. And so, and they were such a great support because if you've never run before, um, and, and I don't want to, you know, turn anybody off running, but when you get onto someone's property and you approach them, um, it's got the ball's kind of in their court. So you, you know, you can be caught off guard with comments and negativity and, and, um, and so, um, so it was good to have that support and I could get back in the car and debrief with them and 
you know, they'd say it's okay. And, and my, my skin definitely got thicker through the course of that election. And that's actually still a work in progress uh, to this day to just try to let things roll off. Um, and then having support in the family, um, which, which I'll be perfectly honest, I, I, I didn't so much. And then unfortunately later into my term in council, um, I, I did end up being divorced, but, um, I, that's not why, but it is so important to have that support. And now I do have a partner, um, who's very supportive in anything I do in politics. Uh, but one of the things when the question you asked, did anything surprise you about the experience and, and it was really remarkable how many people, particularly women who were older, said to me uh, at that time in 2010, I'm 37 years old, I turned 37 during the election, said, I won't vote for you because I don't think you running is fair to your children who were seven and um, I think seven and 10 at the time. They're now 22 and 19. And if you ask them, they'll say, we thought it was great. I mean, the school was right behind town hall. Like it really worked out quite well. They got, um, you know, prime ministers, they got to meet premiers. And um, so, and that, so I, I guess I bring that up because I think don't, you know, don't let that deter, deter you if you're thinking of running. And there are um, you know, ways to work around things and, and to be able to raise a family and to do this job. It's not easy, but if you have that support, um, I, I always want to stress that to people because so many people tried to talk me out of it and I'm glad I didn't listen and that I, I went ahead with it. And, and like I say, my kids and I have talked about it and they said, no, it was good. I mean, of course it had its moments, but uh, um, so yeah, I think that's where, um, yeah, just the support with family and friends. And, and it was, yeah, a lot of, a lot of women helping me. And that was, that was remarkable. And then in the last couple of elections as well, 2018 um, provincial in 2019, I had a lot of women on my team and I just think it's important. So thank you. I, I certainly know what that's like getting some, I've had a couple of people say, well, why, why are you running for regional councillor? Why don't you run for town? Don't you start the town? And I'd be like, no. <laughs> They're completely different issues. Uh, Rowena, over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you uh, as well, Liz, for sharing that very important perspective, because um, I will say that when you put your name on the ballot, and, and I think it's important for us as women to support other women who have the courage to do so, um, it, is, it is a bit scary. Um, and, and, and to be honest with you, as an, ele as an elected official to this day, um, I walk into meetings or virtual meetings, and sometimes I am the only woman in the room. And, and part of why I put my name on the ballot and I go back to Velma's inspiring words is because, you know, I, I've mentored so many young women um, and I have nieces and I have cousins and I say to them, you could be whatever you want to be. And, and I think that for uh, women like us, women who are being inspired tonight and who are listening tonight, we have to um, make space at the table for ourselves and for our nieces and for our daughters and for our grandchildren. Because I will tell you that when more women are in the room, we have a say, a real say on issues like childcare, on issues like gender-based violence, on issues like women's shelter and human trafficking, all of these issues that impact women on, on issues of uh, gender pay gaps and equity. Um, all of those issues are issues that we can talk about if we have a seat at the table. And so that is part of the reason why I put my name on the ballot is because in, in the city of Brampton in 2018, um, it was predominantly all white, men and and Brampton had changed to Velma's point Brampton had changed um, we were now young one of the youngest populations in the country and 73 percent ethnic minorities not represented at that table and after 13 years of organizing campaigns and being the person in the background not being the person on the ballot but the person organizing and knocking on the doors after that many years I said you know what I think it's time that I, I do this because I, I would be letting other, my nieces and all the women I've mentored down if I don't run. So, so, so that is really part of the reason why. Um, and the final thing that, that I would say in terms of what 
uh, surprised me the most are a couple of things. Number one, being authentic and real and just being yourself in front of, at, at the doorsteps and at events and in front of media, that's what matters the most to people. Because if you think about it, everyone's very cynical about politicians anyway. They don't really believe who they are. And as women, you know, Diana would know, April would know, Velma, you would know, we get judged for everything. If we're wearing makeup or no makeup or ripped jeans, I got criticized for wearing ripped jeans, very fashionable ripped jeans, but, <laughs> but you get criticized anyway. And so if that's the situation you're walking into, then you might as well be your authentic self. And so that would be my advice for all women who are in leadership positions, be your, in, be your unapologetic, authentic self all the time. And that is what's gonna resonate with people the most. And that is what makes us different from the stereotypical men who end up in those leadership positions. The final thing um, that I will say is, I always say this around International Women's Day, take your place, own the space, and do it with style, humor, smarts, and grace. And finally, you know, one thing that, that keeps me going whenever um, you know, I get criticized and put down is just remember what you're doing it for. Because if, if, you, don't, if you forget what you're doing it for, and I remember all the time I'm doing it for my son, I'm doing it for my nieces, I'm doing it for all those women that are kind of looking and saying, hey, maybe, maybe I should consider doing it. You, you're doing it for them, not even for yourself, but you're doing it for them so that you can make more room for the at the table for them so that better decisions are going to be made in the future. Well said, Rowena. Hard to top that. I love the authentic self too. I think that's such great advice. And I find that, you know, um, it can be very intimidating to start public speaking and because I think there's a fear that you'll get um, criticism after. And I found that, you know, uh, you'll actually get more praise and acknowledgement than, than you get criticism. There are always going to be people who criticize, but, but not as many people as you expect. And there's way more supporters out there than there, there are people criticizing you. So I'm, I'm going to circle back and start with you, Rowena. Um, today, we're, we're hoping to inspire a few people to consider adding their name to the ballot. And if not the ballot, to consider joining a governance committee, uh, what advice would you offer participants today? And why is it important specifically for more women, marginalized women and women of color to get involved? So I, I kind of covered that in what I shared. I, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, like Velma said earlier, just go, just do it. Um, in my experience, uh, managing campaigns and being involved in politics for a long period of time, um, I was also involved in candidate search. And mm -hmm. in candidate search, when you're asking people to run, um, you know, I remember going around the province asking people to run. And in a room, I tell you, in a room, if you say in a room, how, who would like to run for office? All of the men's hands are go up as if they are entitled and, and they're the ones who should be at the table. And every single time I found an amazing, incredible woman um, who was involved in the community that was part of a board, part of the United Way or in a leadership position, et cetera, you would have to go and ask that woman 10 times before they would even consider saying yes, before they would even consider saying yes. And so, I think um, in terms of those who are interested in putting their name on the ballot, do it. And, and you know, you've got some mentors out there to ask for support on how to get started. It is hard. I'm not going to say it's not easy. And maybe you won't win the first time around like myself and others. But again, like Diana said, it's going to open a huge door of possibilities and network opportunities for you regardless. So even if you lose, you still win, right? Um, and then in terms of uh, people, I think the other question was on organizing, on how to get involved. Why is it important for, for women, marginalized women or women of color to get involved? Yes, 
Um, because representation matters as, as what Velma said, like even the nuances related to um, childcare, related to um, you know, being a human trafficking, women's shelters, that sort of thing. There are, there, as, as a woman of color, that experience is different um, from another person who is not a person of color. Uh, my experience is very different from Velma's experience as a Black woman. And so the, the diversity of voices at the table only contributes to improved policy if the people around the table are open, open enough to listen to each other and work collaboratively. Um, and so I think that's part of the reason why it's so important, especially for people of color and, and marginalized groups to run for office. And I will say that one of the most marginalized groups that are not represented at the table are people with disabilities. Um, and, and, and so folks, you know, that perspective is also incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm going to turn that question over to Liz and then April, uh, advice for participants. Why is it important that uh, these voices are represented? Liz? Rowena, that was a perfect segue for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like you did it on purpose. <laughs> so I think the, the one thing, why is it important for disabled people to be represented? It goes back to representation. If you want people to listen and to hear and to recognize what you have to say and how it, why it's important, you need to find a way in. And absolutely. So the challenge of course, is that the very nature of campaigning is not necessarily disability friendly. Mm. April, you mentioned that in your, in your writing, it was important to have a car. Well, I don't drive. A lot of disabled people don't. So how are we going to be able to access those spaces where the, the default is, well, you have to have a car. Well, if you don't have a car, if you can't drive, and that's not for just disabled women, that's for women experiencing poverty as well. If you don't have a car, you can't drive, and you're in a rural area, what do you do? Then let's look at things as simple as basic as the campaign halls or the spaces in which you might be called upon to present your ideas. Well, if, if there are mobility challenges and you've got a staircase to deal with, guess who's not gonna be able to make a presentation unless I do it on the sidewalk? If I have IBS and I need to have an accessible washroom close by and there isn't one, well, guess who's not going to be able to make that presentation? Mm -hmm. So it's voices are important and invitation is key, but so is welcoming. And to have those spaces be welcoming, we really have to reimagine what those spaces look like. I've looked, for example, at some of the the Niagara Council meetings. And I know I couldn't participate in them for the simple reason that they're too long. Mm. As a disabled person who cannot sit that long and who doesn't function well in the evening, well, like, well, there's no point in running for council because I couldn't be able, I, I can't participate. So automatically the systems themselves are writing people out. Mm. And so that's why for me, it's, it's a system, it's a systems issue, not just to, to get people to be represented, you have to find way, you have to look at what's what's holding them back. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's transportation, sometimes it's timing. I even I saw one of the people in, in the chat mentioning that they were hoping that this presentation will be recorded because as a person with children at home, this isn't a really good time for her to participate. Mm -hmm. So again women with children, single mothers. These are all issues that we really need to confront if we really truly want to see a diverse group of people participating in all areas, we have to confront how we do it and where we do it. That's great, Liz, thank you. Just, just as follow up to that, parts of the session are being recorded and will be made available based on the permissions uh, that we were given 
uh, for the participants. Um, April, over to you. What advice do you have for our, our participants today? Well, thank you. And I and now it's a segue from what Liz said into how uh, I, I was hoping to answer uh, when Liz was talking about um, like like it made me think about being a single mother. And I know when I ran in party politics, I was encouraged to run, um, you know, provincially and then federally. And th those are a pretty big deal. But there's so much like you have to take time off work. And, and uh, you know, I was a single mom at the time. My kids are older. And it's so it is very limiting. Like, um, you know, a lot of people will say, well, we want to, you know, a lot of men will say we want to get women involved and, and they and they like to say, well, look, at the single mom that's running well, but the single mom can't afford to run. And, you know, that was really, really frustrating. And then in terms of Liz, all the things you said about, um, you know, people with disabilities and limits, you're you're 100 percent right. Um, and, you know, hopefully with Zoom becoming um, more popular through the pandemic, that might have some advantages, but um, but yeah, you've made you made some great points. I know there was more I want to touch on it now. I can't I can't remember. But um, the one thing I was going to say was that, um, you know, in terms of advice for people who want to run and getting out there and getting your name, because uh, earlier Rowena made the point about name recognition and incumbency. And so that's where social media comes in. We know social media can be really negative and we have to be I had actually written down be cautiously active um, on social media, but there are ways, um, you know, to get your name out that way. And, and Rowena had also mentioned, you know, being out in the public and being your authentic self. And now with the pandemic kind of leveling out, hopefully it's a great time if you're thinking of running in in the fall. Um, to get out to the community events and, and get chatting with people and um, uh, and I think just even, you know, attending, well, I think council meetings now are still virtual, but attending council meetings and talking to different people. Um, and it's important too, if you're really considering doing this to, you know, to ask for help, to ask for help from family and friends and, uh, and people that, you know, in the community and, and reach out. So, um, and I just wish, I apologize, I'm having a total blank because there's something else I wanted to say because Liz said something that was amazing and now I've forgotten. So maybe I'll, I'll turn to you, Diana, later if it comes back to me. Sure, no problem. <laughs> All I, right. I, um, I do want to add, um, you know, having name recognition, it's not impossible to still get elected. And I'm just going to speak from my own experience. I, I ran for the first time in 2018. I had just changed my name uh, three months before that, because I had gotten married and, and people who knew me didn't know it was my name on the ballot. And I ran against two incumbents. So it, it, where there's a will, there is a way and it is definitely not impossible. Did you have your thought back, April? I did. And actually, I, I don't know where my brain is tonight because it, it was a bit different than, than what Liz had been saying. But um, with the question, why is it more important for women and marginalized women and women of color to get involved? And Velma touched on it earlier. And I was aware, of course, of the, the lack of representation at the region and the municipal councils. But when Velma uh, actually listed the statistics, you think, oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. And I think that in itself is why it's so important because Niagara is changing and it's changing fast and it's showing it's so much more evident that we're not represented uh, the way that we should be so I think if, if if you know anybody's listening tonight like that there's the encouragement there because it's so true I mean Niagara so it's just so off balance um, you know I'm happy to see more women on regional council this term but I mean Diana I know you agree with me it's still it's still not enough um, so, so yeah, if, if that can even be a motivation tonight for people to, to consider it, throw, throw caution to the wind. And I promise you, it'll be an amazing experience. Mm -hmm. We're, so we're, we're a little over in my time allotment. However, I want to get one audience question. And there was a question around what skills are most essential to being a successful politician. And I'm going to go to, um, Rowena and then April. Um, I'll, I'll share my personal experience. So being, uh, and, and folks could probably resonate with this as well, because it applies to many things, many things that women do in leadership positions. And that is as, as a woman, um, in a world that is still predominantly men, I find that I still have to wake up earlier. I have to work twice, sometimes three times as hard and still, and accept the fact that I may get half the credit for the work that I do. 
Um, and, and I think that, um, you know, that is, that is one of the things that for me being a successful elected official at this point in time as a counselor, is just that hard work ethic. I do my homework, I prepare, and I maintain my authentic self. And I got to tell you how important that is, because being your authentic self means that you're bringing integrity to your job and you're bringing, you're putting a responsibility on your shoulders that is really about you and your word and who you are as a leader and who you are as a person. And so, so my, my advice is, is do the hard work. You have to always be prepared and do the hard work um, regardless of what the other folks on the council table are doing or not doing most of the time, <laughs> but, but do the hard work, be prepared. And, and accept the fact that that is your responsibility and also maintain integrity in your job. Maintaining integrity in my job is very important by being my authentic self. Mm -hmm. April, what's, this, what's that magic skill set that a politician needs? Well, I, I mean, Rowena nailed it. Um, she, she really did cover a lot of, I, I totally agree a hundred percent. I did see something pop up in the chat about media dealing with the media. Um, so those are skills that I think that um, they're all, they're fluid, number one. And I think that there's something you, those you think you learn as you go, but I'm sure like it, it's definitely something I know, actually, I forgot about this. Uh, prior to running for council, I did spend a year in Toastmasters um, to help me with my public speaking skills. And I will admit to this day, I still get nervous. It is not my favorite thing to do. I had to do an announcement with some provincial ministers this morning in the falls and I was, I get worked up about it, but it's gotten better over the years. But yeah, the the public speaking, if, if there's a way to, you know, to be able to, uh, to work on that and, um, yeah, and prepare, like, like everything Rowena said, to be prepared to read, to be, you know, knowledge is key. If you're informed, then you, you can't, you know, you can't go wrong. Um, and hard work ethic as well. And I totally agree with the authentic self, because anytime I try to be somebody I'm not, and along the way, you will get people saying, you need to be more this, you need to do this, you need to act like this. Um, I know when we we're talking, Rowena was talking about ripped jeans. I can't remember how many people were so fascinated with how I had dark hair when I got elected as mayor. And then now I'm blonde and I'll have people say, I liked it better when your hair was dark. I think, okay, well, it's blonde right now, but anyway, um, yeah, just to be you and, and, um, and because that's, I find when I trip over myself is when I try to do what, what other people expect me to do. And, and it's taken me a long time to learn that. So, uh, so I hope that's helpful to some of the people uh, who are tuned in. Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to add to what April said, because it's, it, because it relates to public speaking. And I know that folks are nervous about public speaking, but again, like when you speak from the heart and when you speak from the place of just being you, the words just come out. And, and so that's why it's so important to the job to, to maintain that integrity with yourself. Mm -hmm. I, so I'm, I'm going to add, especially when you put your name on your campaign, you have to get really comfortable with talking about yourself and selling yourself. And I think that's a lot, that's very challenging uh, for a lot of women who are traditionally taught, you know, to not to bring attention to yourself and to um, perhaps not, you know, stand out and you really need to be able to be comfortable with that. So, um, I'm going to ask Liz real quick, um, skill set to be a, an effective committee member to participate in a way that, you know, really gets your voice heard. What do you suggest? Listen more than you talk mm. and watch the other people around the table. And that when you have something to say, I can't agree more with Rowena and April. Say it, mean it, own it. Yeah. Um, I, I like to tell people, you know, you're at that meeting because you've been chosen for your voice. So press the button, put your hand up, contribute. That that's your voice is needed in that space. So I'm I'm glad that you um you all shared that. Listen, there's lots of love in the chat tonight. I think everyone really loved your, your contributions today. So uh, that concludes our panel discussion. I want to thank everyone for the phenomenal conversation. Um, lots of great advice. I'm hoping our uh, participants got a lot of great information out of that. 
And uh, hopefully we have a few more ladies on the ballot this, uh, this October. Uh, so Cassie, I'm gonna turn it back to you so you can uh, move forward on the rest of the session. Excellent, thank you so much, Diana. And I am uh, really amazed at the quality of the discussion that we had tonight. Uh, great input, great questions. I know we didn't get to too many of the questions. I have copied them all down and uh, a number of them we will address in some future sessions. So please uh, make sure that you come to those and we'll get some of those questions answered. And even if they weren't necessarily part of what we had planned, we'll make sure that we work them into those sessions as well so that you can get those answers. Um, so we, uh, I'm gonna launch a follow-up poll with that are gonna be the same as those first four questions in terms of your, um, kind of your confidence level, your level of knowledge and whatnot, hopefully, um, although it's, you know, very close to, uh, the session right now, and you might not have absorbed everything yet. Hopefully there was some useful information. So I'm going to launch that now. You should be seeing it on your screen. Uh, we're also going to send out a short evaluation in the next week um, where we will be asking you uh, just a couple of questions in terms of how you found this session, if there's any um, comments that you have on how we can improve the following set, the next coming sessions. Um, and we'll also, within that, we'll have a link for our next session, which will be on Thursday, May 5th at 6 p.m. And we will also, in that, um, that email and, and evaluation, we'll have a link to uh, people who might be interested in participating in a short mentorship program. So we will pair up women uh, who are thinking of running with an experienced female counselor and provide a couple of opportunities to ask specific questions before running. So some of that just like we were talking about here, you know, getting some support or getting spent a little bit of one on one time with someone who's done it before just to give you that little oomph of extra encouragement to help you get started. Uh, so our next session, uh, session number two will be virtual as well. We will focus on details about getting organized to run what you need to know to put your name on the ballot or support someone else who needs to run. So there was a few questions that uh, came in the chat about some of the specifics like fundraising and putting your team together. So those will be things that we're gonna address at that next session. Our third session will be on Wednesday, June 1st at 6 p.m. where we'll talk about the differences between regional and local level politics. And I did see some uh, questions about that in the, in the chat as well. You know, what is local? What does that mean? Um, and so when we talk about regional and local, uh, in Niagara, we're a two-tiered municipality. So we have the regional level, which uh, um, Diana is one of our regional counselors. And then we also have local uh, area municipalities, as we call them here. And so those are our cities or our towns or townships in Niagara. And there's 12 of those here in Niagara. And uh, so they also have their own counselors. And then the mayors of each of those are part of the regional council as well. So there's a whole lot of different positions, different things that you can run for. What is the difference? What do, why would I want to run for regional councilor versus a, a local area councilor versus a mayor or just get involved in a, in a committee or even we haven't talked about today about school boards. Um, that's another opportunity that you can put your name on the ballot for. So there's lots of different opportunities but what do you wanna do there? You know, which one should you go for? So we'll talk about that in the third session. And then our final session of this series will be on Wednesday, June 29th at 6 p.m. again. And this one is gonna focus on addressing political scrutiny, uh, potential bias or discrimination that you may face while campaigning or while running, in, while being in office. So some advice on how you can prepare for it and how you can respond and address it both uh, if you're the one receiving it or you're seeing it happening, what can you do um, and support other people that are running, which so many of you have provided in your advice tonight. So I'm just gonna check on the status of this poll. Uh, and we've got most people that have participated. So thank you again, a lot of people really interested uh, in, in getting involved. So that's fabulous. Uh, and so I'm gonna, end the poll now. And I'm gonna say a final thank you to everyone who's come today to participate. A special thank you to uh, Velma as our keynote speaker, Rowena, Liz and April as our panelists and Diana as our moderator. So thank you so much.
And we hope to see you all at our next session. Have a great day.